Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 42, Leaning Out the Window, with Philippus Heye. I'm Mark Kane. I'm thrilled I got to spend time with Philippus. My wife's family has roots in Germany, and she was talking to her mom the moment I first heard from Philippus in a voice message. Karen, I said, tell mom I've heard from a listener in Germany. Her mom was tickled. She has traced her family's genealogy in Germany, has friends there, and has traveled there. That first contact from Philippus was six months ago, back in June of 2021, and I included his message in episode 29 when I interviewed Jay and Eileen Kunzman. I've been hoping to talk to Philippus at length since then, and the day has finally arrived. Mom, mom mom-in-law that is, not my mom the puppeteer. Mom, you'll be pleased, I think. We've included some German history in this. If you're a Unitarian Christian who realized that God was one person, a he, not a they, later in life, it was probably a process. You certainly thought, what am I going to do now? Perhaps you have considered taking part in a debate on this topic. Well, you're talking about sticking your neck out in a rather public way. It's not uncommon for new Unitarian Christians to want to do this. It's an outlet for all that studying and thinking that you've poured into it. You may be seriously thinking of doing it. Well, I want to suggest you listen to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, episodes 196 through 200. Host Dustin Smith, he was my guest in episode 9, does an excellent job of talking through his debate with Kelly Powers that occurred last month, November 2021. Dustin describes his preparation process, his thoughts and approach, and he disassembles the arguments and rebuttals. I consider it a valuable resource for any who are new to debating or who want to sharpen their skills. I just want to thank Dustin for not only putting the effort into the debate in the first place, but for the detailed follow-up, now preserved in podcast form, for the benefit of others, like us. Philippus faced some decisions as he moved beyond the traditional Trinitarian formulations. He had to find a manageable level of sticking his neck out that worked for him. Philippus, I'm delighted to finally get to talk to you. We've been planning this conversation for many months. That's true. (laughs) So it took a while. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's wonderful. Happy to be here. So I can hear the sound of your room. It's... It sounds like it's a kind of large room with with a lot of echo. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> but it, it sounds like... Is that like a brick building, a stone building? Yeah, it is it is actually a brick building from the outside. Mm-hmm. It's the old post office of this town. Now the post office is just a small office place, a very tiny place. But it used to be a huge post office. We are living in the flat of the former postmaster maybe 50 years ago or so. <laughs> <laughs> How old would you say that building is then? I think 200 years old. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah. so, okay, as we listen to the sound of your kids, maybe I can hear them talk in the background very distantly. Okay. What they're hearing is these old solid post office walls echoing the sound from a 200-year-old building. That's so interesting. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tell us about where you're from Mm -hmm. so people can appreciate your accent. Yeah, sure. So I'm from Germany. I actually grew up around the area of Stuttgart. An English-speaking person would say Stuttgart, Mm -hmm. which is in the southwest. Um, And so that has been part of the uh, Western German side. I was born shortly before the wall fell. So I was still born in Western Germany. But now I'm living in Saxony, which is part of Eastern Germany. It's a very different culture here, even for German, it's, it's different. There's a lot less believers also, because the GDR was really strong on trying to push atheism and get people out of believing anything. And when you say the GDR, explain what that would be. It's the German Democratic Republic. So that was the communist Eastern German part. Okay. So Eastern Germany is still different than Western Germany, Mm -hmm. even though politically the differences are gone. Basically, but you still notice it. Like people here have a much stronger connection with their country. In this region where I'm living in right now, there's not so many foreigners Mm. because foreigners have been coming into Germany since the end of the Second World War. But 
mostly to Western Germany and then to Eastern Germany only much later. Berlin is in the middle of Eastern Germany, so the capital is, but Berlin has always been separated into West and East Berlin, so there was always a Western side of Berlin. So Berlin is very different, but the rest of Eastern Germany um, also has uh, much more problems with the whole, you know, Corona and politics. So this is where you really see political difference in Eastern and Western Germany, because the people here, they remember the time of Stasi and control from the government. And so everything that looks like control from a government, they don't like it. <laughs> it's a little bit like Texas. <laughs> I've lived in Texas for a year, so <laughs> what it sometimes feels like people who are happy to be their own people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it goes a little weird. Sometimes it's really cool, but really friendly people. I, I enjoy living here. That's interesting. I hadn't realized that the differences were still that noticeable. Mm -hmm. It's like the North and the South in the United States. It's the East and the West in Germany. Yeah. Just different. It's different, yeah. We even have difference in wages. Like uh, Eastern Germans usually get less for the same job than people in Western Germany. Living costs are also lower. So like rent or even buying houses or ground is much cheaper here. Interesting. But now, now traveling between East and West Germany is just a car ride. It's I mean, true, yeah. And you wouldn't know you got to another side of Germany unless you, what, looked at the prices and talked to the people? I mean, does it feel otherwise? Oh, well, there, there are some differences, but probably as an outsider, you would not notice it so quickly. Okay. I've met people that said they felt it spiritually, like believers that who, who were like, okay, I noticed the presence here in Eastern Germany is different than in Western Germany. I'm not that kind of guy who is having these senses, or I don't know. <laughs> I'm working in, in a Christian organization, and it's fairly strong in the charismatic area. So there are people who maybe, you know, deal with some things that people from other denominations don't know so much about or never experienced people sharing stuff like that. So Eastern Germany is still under the residual effect of how it was many years ago. Mm -hmm. How would that difference in religion and faith be manifested? Mm -hmm. So the West is also different depending on the area you are in at. But I grew up in the area of Stuttgart, which I like to call the Bible button of Germany. Um, we don't have a Bible belt like the US, but we have a Bible <laughs> button. Yeah. Um, and most of believing Germans you meet also internationally, I would say like one out of three comes out of that area. Hmm. But then, I mean, there are other areas as well that are pretty Christian. Uh, but we also have very strong Catholic areas. And so that's obviously very different. Like when you go to Bavaria, that's very Catholic. Mm. And so I come out of this very Christian region. There were many different churches and not only state churches, but a lot of free churches, Methodists, Baptists, charismatic churches, mm. uh, independent churches, all of that. Uh, and here in Eastern Germany, it, I would say that the, the communist system here has just been effective in two things wiping out economy and wiping out faith. And that is really a strong thing. Like I met a young guy, talked with him a little bit, and then I, I shared also that I'm a Christian. Uh, we eventually came to talk about Christmas and, and he was like, what is Christmas? And he was my age and I was like, what? I, how can a person in Germany not know what Christmas is? But this is the reality for many people in Eastern Germany. They just have no connection at all with anything faith-based. They don't learn it in school. Like even today, you can choose religion, religious class to learn stuff about that, but you don't have to. And so many don't because they don't know it from their parents. They don't know it from their grandparents. If, if they're lucky, maybe they had one of the few families that preserved faith. So my wife, for example, she's also from Eastern Germany. Her family, they preserved faith, hmm. but it's not a common thing. For a family to preserve their faith in an area that had been very communist, what was that like? Was it just privately in their home? Did they have small groups? It uh, varied a little bit. There were some state churches allowed still, and some had good pastors, but some were strongly influenced by the government and politics and, and the Stasi. So it was not so easy. Um, you, you could, I think, fairly well go under the radar, um, especially if you were not politically active, which many Christians were not. One example is coming actually from my wife, from her family. The kids, they would go into certain groups in, in school and then outside of school. It was basically atheistic or communist indoctrination that they did with the kids very early on. Hmm. And so her mom, when her kids were supposed to go there as well, when her mom went there, she went to the principal of the school and said, sorry, but my kids will not join. And the principal said, like, excuse me, Miss Schmidt, are you sure that you want to do that? Because you will 
block their future. They will not be able to get a high school degree. They will not be able to go to university. They will be just having very simple lives if you do that, if you don't allow them to join our clubs. And she was like, well, do you know what happens in 10 years? My kids are just following one guy and that's Jesus. And so she was really firm on that. Mm. And actually 10 years later, the wall fell down. So she was true with her saying to this principle, <laughs> if you were strong on it and if you would um, make things clear, you would um, have disadvantages. So she just persisted with her family and then her kids didn't go to those mm. classes. Did they even attend the schools at all or was it just yeah. not going to those particular classes? It was just those particular events. You know, the, the system tried to pretend everything was optional and free and nothing was forced upon people. Uh, obviously, they were there was a lot of spying on people and control that happened. But basically, everything was optional and free. But if you didn't do it, then, well, you had some disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> they say here, um, alle, alle Menschen sind gleich, aber manche sind gleicher, which means everybody's equal, but some are more equal. Yes, yes. Oh, the world is just such an interesting <laughs> place. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> But now, what? so describe the difference now, because it's not being forced, I guess, in the classes the same way. The government isn't pushing it. No. Eastern Germany now, from school system and politically and everything, like it's the same as Western Germany. There's one system. But Western Germany is also way less Christian than it used to be. Mm. It was founded, you know, when the constitution was written after the Second World War, that they, they put in Christian values and even, you know, um, stated that this is a Christian nation. Oh. Nothing like that anymore. Like most of our politicians, they don't care at all about God. It's, it's no reality in daily life anymore for most people. Mm. So there's a very small percentage of really true believers here in Germany, you know, who say that Jesus is Lord and they act upon it. Mm. They treat him as their king. So that's not such a high percentage. But in Western Germany, there's still this family tradition at least. When you go to church on Easter and on Christmas, it's much more part of the culture. Like you hear Bible stories when you're a kid. And here in Eastern Germany, the parents don't know it. So why would they teach it to their children? Mm. Like, why would I read a Bible story? Uh, like, why would I read a fairy tale to my kid? That's basically the understanding that they would come up with. <laughs> yeah. I have some friends who are from Prague. Mm -hmm. What you just described fits what I think their experience is. Faith in their area was just kind of just done away with. Yeah. Was Prague under the same kind of a government at the time? Like Yeah, it was also part of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So basically, yes, but they have made some statistics about all the nations under the Soviet Union and how well faith was restored after the wall fell down. Mm -hmm. And um, Eastern Germany is the last point of it. I think it's considered the most atheistic country in the world when you treat it as its own country. Mm. But... Yeah, it's other countries have suffered equally under those regimes. Wow. Okay. So how did you get to a, become a Christian of a particular theological position in Germany? <laughs> so I was raised Christian. My parents were Christian. And I grew up in a charismatic church, but it was very strongly Bible focused. So I always loved the Bible and loved truth and have my faith based on a solid foundation, not just some experience that I had which I think is something that you sometimes find amongst charismatics. But my church had kind of like a little bit of a mixture of both sides. So it was charismatic, but also very strong on the Bible. Okay. And when I finished high school, I did this kind of like a social year here in Germany. And this is where I went to Youth with a Mission. Um, Youth with a Mission is an international organization, comes from the US, was founded in 1960, and is a big missions organization active all over the world, around 200 nations, we have active bases. And so I went to one of those bases here in Germany. And this is where I fell in love with this organization as well. It's youth oriented. Mm. Um, and it has a strong aspect of discipleship. So I, that's something I really love. Also, there were, were a lot of encounters that I had with God. So I was like, okay, this is, uh, I guess, where my future is going. Um, studied business administration in between. Mostly I was working in administration. That's, I realized, okay, this is something I can do well. Okay. A youth with a Mission is also a very charismatic organization. I would say much more than my church was. Mm. And it's traditionally Trinitarian also. Okay. And then there came a point in my life. I met my wife. We got married. And then there was a time where she did a training, uh, which lasted for three months. And I stepped back from working 
full time and took care of our kids. I'm really grateful for this in my organization or that we are able to do that. Mm. I think because I suddenly had a lot of time, I started to wrestle with a few ideas and open my mind to some thoughts that I've not been able to process. And so I was like, okay, hmm, not everything that I'm reading agrees and fits to what I'm believing. So I want to take a closer look into some stuff. Okay. And that put me on a journey that started around four years ago. The first big topic that came up was around the Catholic Church. Mm. So there was this one teaching that I uh, watched and listened to. There was a guy sharing about, you know, a lot of church history and then the Catholic Church, how it developed over the ages, but then also uh, how it is today and how many false ideas came out of the Catholic Church. Mm. That was really interesting for me because in Youth with a Mission, there's a strong drive, I would say, to reconnect back as Protestants, reconnect back with the Catholic Church and just search for unity in general. With the Catholic Church? Yeah, with, even with the Catholic Church. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, kind of like the idea of, hey, we are all believing in Jesus. So, you know, we have that foundation. Let's stand together in unity. And that's something I found attractive in my young 20s. But then when I saw this, what this guy was sharing, I was like, oh, wait a second. That sounds not so good then to go all in into unity that there are some things that are really concerning. Mm. And I was like, okay, but maybe he's you know just making stuff up. So I actually bought some of the catechisms and some of the teaching books of the Catholic Church to look into that. Ah. Some stuff is really concerning. So <laughs> I would agree with him on, on many points. That was really interesting. It gave me a lot of understanding in church history. Also, you know, how things were changed from the early generations of the apostles into the generations of the church fathers. And it, it's like, where, where did you get that from? It, yeah. It's not coming from the Bible. Um, he was sharing all these things, these doctrines that the Catholic Church has or has developed and how they were bad. And then eventually he came to the Trinity and he you know, explained that the Roman Catholic Church says uh, something like the core doctrine that everything is built on is the Trinity. But he was a Trinitarian. And so he was like, this is really good. And at least they got this right. I was a Trinitarian back then. And I was like, wait a second. Like, basically, you say everything that the Catholic Church has been coming up with is wrong. But her main doctrine should be right. Like, why? It didn't make sense to me. Anyways, you know, mm. I, I was a Trinitarian myself, so I, I had no framework to put it into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was your first introduction to the idea that something might be uh, wrong. Yes. Seeing this and reflecting about theology helped me a lot to rethink a lot of the doctrines that I heard in general. And so the next topic that I came into was connected to the law, uh, where I wrestled with this, is the law done away with, which was the teaching that I grew up with, mm -hmm. and wrestled with this idea and came to this um, understanding of John Lawson. He's a guy that was in your podcast. Yes. He, uh, he was in episode 32, Negotiating with Trinitarians. Yeah. That was the one with John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But this topic and wrestling with the law really led to me questioning a lot of my own faith that I had until then, okay. but also brought me to this point where I said, okay, this is, I, I have to be careful that I don't go down some strange path that doesn't make sense according to the Bible. So I really want to test the new things that I'm thinking. I want to test them to the Bible. Is this really true? Mm -hmm. And so I decided to do a regular Bible school that is very traditional in their doctrines, nothing strange or weird. And so we moved as a family, we moved to Texas. And this is where I did Bible school year long, learned some Greek. And it was also Bible school from Youth with a Mission. Youth with a Mission is a huge organization and there's a university connected to it. So you can make bachelor's and master's degrees and all of that. Okay. I didn't follow a degree program, but just did this Bible school course. Okay. You know, I came in with this, I want to learn more about the Bible in general, but I also want to wrestle with these questions about the law that I have. Is my mind off or is there something to it? Hmm. It was maybe the second week or so we had the teaching about the Trinity and a teacher argued the I am statements from Jesus and John and how they connect back to Exodus. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit like something might be off with the Trinity, but I cannot point my finger to anything. So I, yeah, I agreed basically with what he was saying. Like sound reasonable to me. I went along with it. Okay. But then somewhere, maybe a half a year later, I remember 
I was researching something on Greek because we also learn Greek. And so I was on a, on a website. It was a secular website about Greek grammar. Hmm. Um, and there they shared something about how Christians mess up with grammar, uh, the <laughs> Greek constructs. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and so they, they talked there about this I am thing. Uh, because the I am in Greek is ego emi. Mm -hmm. um, so ego is, is the I and emi is the M in, in that case. Mm -hmm. And that's used in the New Testament quite often. But always when, uh, when it's used for Jesus, it says basically I am. But when somebody else says it, it says, I am the one or I am he. Yeah. It's a general sentence that makes sense, even if you just say ego emi. When Jesus says it, our translations phrase it in a way that it's looking like this is God speaking. Yeah. The article went on further and said that when you try to connect it back to the Old Testament, it doesn't even make sense because uh, in Exodus, the, um, the Hebrew, I, I am who I am, when it was translated into Greek in the Septuagint, God says, Ego emi ho on, I am the being. But then he also says to Moses, when they ask you who sent you, tell them ho on sent you, not ego emi sent you, but ho on sent you. Mm. The focus is on the being, not on I am. Yeah. You know, theologians and my school leader did this. He connected the ego emi in the New Testament back to the Greek of the Old Testament and the Septuagint. Yeah. So I went to him and said, hey, I found this online and it seems like what you were teaching doesn't fit. Can you help me a bit? And then he was like, uh, well, hmm, just check my notes again that I gave you, and then you should be fine. I was like, well, thank you. I already did this. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think also to a degree, his answer, you know, that he kind of like ignored my question for truth. Yeah. That catapulted me into, okay, I have to look into this topic. Something <laughs> is off here. Something is off. And that just spiraled yeah. me on. <laughs> Yeah, that should be a lesson to teachers everywhere. If they come at you asking hard questions about the Trinity and you blow them off, that will probably send them further. Yes. That doesn't resolve the problem. Yes. <laughs> it, it inflames the interest. Like, what is happening here? Yes. Why? Why? Anyway, that's, that's quite funny. Yeah. All right. How long ago were you in Texas then? Um, it ended summer 2018. Okay, so it wasn't terribly long ago. Three and a half years, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then where does this story go from here? So after this time, I really felt that God is calling me more into teaching. Hmm. And coming back to Germany, everybody in our German organization, we are about 300 people here. They knew me as the administrator. <laughs> <laughs> when they had questions with finances, when they had questions with law, they came to me. They still do. But it was a challenge a bit for me to, you know, how do I rebrand myself coming back to Germany? Hmm. Uh, we came back and then I got an email from one of the discipleship program leaders. Uh, and she asked me if I would want to teach a friend, encouraged her to ask me because he knew that I just finished my Bible school. So why not teach? Why not? So that was awesome for me. So I came into this challenge. I was like, okay, hmm, I'm going now teaching in a discipleship program. What do I do with all these new ideas that I have and how far can I be comfortable to lean out of the window? I'm still in the Trinitarian organization. Um, if I start to talk about things uh, regarding the Trinity and the problems that I see uh, at that time, it was really just in a baby stage, I would say, in my understanding. Mm. But the problems, when you looked into the Bible, they were so clear and so obvious. And so mm. I actually did it. Like I, I went into this, this teaching week and I opened that can of worms a bit. Oh, I just uh, opened the question and said, okay, this is our understanding of the Trinity, you know, how we see God usually. Um, but when you read it, some Bible verses, then you have problems. You see these places where Paul or even Jesus himself says that the Father is the God of Jesus. How do we make sense of that? What, what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. So I, I opened it a little bit. Yeah. And it was interesting discussion. Um, but for us as a family, the challenge came, like, how, is there still space for us even working in, in our organization because it's Trinitarian? Mm -hmm. Or do we have to leave? But at this point, though, you didn't have an alternate view solidified in your mind, did you? You're still in this questioning stage? That's right. It sounds like you just knew that what they were teaching for the for, as the Trinity mm -hmm. didn't work and you were willing to ask questions, but yeah. now you didn't fit in. Okay. Yeah. And I, I remember even at the end of this teaching around the Trinity, I said to the students, so what, what you can clearly see is that theology has not solved this problem yet. So maybe one of you will come up and eventually, you know, 
um, get a degree in, in theology and maybe come up with a Trinitarian idea that makes much more sense. My thought was maybe there's still a Trinity that makes sense, but the one we have right now doesn't make sense for sure. <laughs> okay. Wow. I had at that point never heard of biblical Unitarians. Mm. All right. So did that get you kicked out? I mean, somebody had to take notice of what you were teaching and set you aside and have a conversation with you. <laughs> that fortunately didn't happen. Really? So actually the leader of that base, he translated me for that session. What, what do you mean he translated you? You mean like... From, from English to German. Okay, so you were teaching it in which language? In English. Okay, and he was translating it to German because most of your students were German? It was a mix, yeah. If, if it would be all of them, I would have been teaching in German. But since it was a mix, I can teach in English. I've been studying everything in English for the past year. So that's easier for me to speak it in English and then you translate to German. Oh, okay. All right. So he was following along with you the whole time. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then the week after, I met the same guy again because there was a national gathering of all the leaders. And uh, we were talking and then somebody else came by and, and then the base leader said, oh yeah, last week, Philippus, he taught in, in our school and... Well, I translated him on this one topic and it really made me to question the Trinity. I was like, oh my goodness, no, I, I didn't want to go so far. Like, <laughs> oh, what, what's happening now? This, this might spiral really yeah. uh, fast into something that I don't want it to. Oh, no. But uh, that didn't happen. And actually the whole topic calmed down a lot over the coming years. Okay. As a family, we've been traveling, we've been living in Norway for some time. And then it, because COVID happened, we realized, okay, we, we need to settle down someplace. We cannot keep on traveling as easy. Like, and then we felt that God calls us to this base in Saxony. Okay. And so we went to the leadership of the base and the leadership, uh, two guys, one is this one guy who translated me back then. Oh. But apparently he didn't remember anything of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was two and a half years ago at that point, but anyways. Okay. Uh, and we, you know, talk with them. We share that we think we would like to be there. They were super excited for us wanting to join them. But then in the end, I said, okay, well, I want to mention just two things because you would be our leaders here. But one thing is we have a little bit of a different approach when it comes to the law. And the other thing is uh, we have some issues with the Trinity and have a little bit of a different understanding. At that point, I would say I was a biblical Unitarian and had much more understanding also and could argue my points really well also. And they were like, oh, wow, especially on the point of the Trinity, they were a little shocked. Mm. But they were like, okay, well, I think that should be fine. That was the response. I was like, okay, wow, that went well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they didn't ask you to explain it. They, they just no. were ready to, no. okay. Nothing to it. And this maybe has to do with our organization because we're basically, we're a lay movement. Um, although we have the university and we have people that have bachelor's and master's degrees also in theology, but mm. for the most part, we are still more of a lay movement. And so talking about theology is not everyone's forte. Ah. Yeah. So, so they said, well, sure. Okay, no problem. And you will be basically signed in as new staff coming Friday. And then the next morning I received a message. Um, well, we have to reconsider some stuff. We need a few more days to talk. Um, and then two days later, we received another message. Unfortunately, we have to say, you cannot be staff here. And we're like, what? We have personal relationship that goes back a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, we knew each other from, from national meetings and all of that. Somebody who is part of the national leadership um, and then wanting to join a local ministry, local base, being rejected, that's something I've never heard of in, in our organization. Uh, maybe as a side note to that, in our organization, we, we don't receive a salary, but everything mm. is paid through fundraising, su support circle or friends, partners in, in our ministry. Us applying at that base to join them as staff had nothing to do with money. You're a volunteer, and yeah. that's probably why they're always happy when people show up and are ready to work. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got it spot on. <laughs> But not this time. Not this time. Yeah. yeah. So that was a big shock. As a couple, we were like, okay, wow, is this now the point that we had been anxiously waiting for, if it might come, that we get kicked out of our organization for theological reasons? Yeah. We, we had a lot of friends stand with us then uh, within the next couple days. Um, and then the weird thing happened that we felt like 
we should stand up against it and say, no, we don't think this is the right decision that you reject us here. Mm. We think you should reconsider that. Okay. We actually did this. Uh, we went to them and started to pray also a lot. And then uh, both leaders, they came then and uh, wanted to hear our reasons, like theologically, why we don't uh -huh. agree with the Trinity. So then it happened. Then it finally happened. Yeah, finally. <laughs> uh, but it took a long time. It was, I think, a process of two, two and a half months. Mm. In the end, they came to the conclusion, okay, we'll accept you. Um, so that it had a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. So how much discussion did you have to have with them to get your point across to the point where they felt that they understood what you were saying? I, I met with both leaders one-on-one, -on -one, and each one totally understood our point in that one meeting. It's like one mm. and a half hours. The ones that I even, uh, I see it biblically, what you say, it does make sense. Um, I, I personally don't agree with it, but it totally makes sense. I don't see any fault with it. Hmm. But their concern was that the whole thing could create ripple effects that they cannot foresee amongst staff, amongst students that will come in the future, that some parents might get upset. Uh, my kid heard something about the Trinity not being true. Oh, you know. Yeah. So they didn't have a problem with me believing that the Trinity is wrong, but they had a problem with the effects that it could create for the organization. Right. And that was their issue. Well, that makes sense. So how did they decide to let you back in then, if that was their concern? I think because it was such an unknown concern, it was something that might go wrong in the future. Hmm. I think that was the reason why one of the leaders was, I think this is too weak of a reason for us to reject them. And the other one was like, no, I think we should stand on principle and reject them. And so, because there's a leadership of two people, they were like, uh, nobody can make the decision here. Uh, eventually we took it up, you know, then the national leader was uh, involved as a kind of like a mediator. So then I was basically exposed as the non-Trinitarian in our organization. <laughs> yeah. At least on the leadership levels, a few people know it now. Yeah. Which is good. So far we are still in. <laughs> they didn't kick us out. So that other third party that came in and heard it, how did that go? Uh, the basic thing that came through was, it's okay, you know, if you believe in a different way. And in our organization, we don't have a statement of belief where you have to sign, you know, like Calvinistic faith or something like that. We don't have mm. that. We have a few people that come out from the Catholic Church. We have people that come out from traditional Protestant churches, people from charismatic churches. It's a very big mix. Okay. And so, therefore, the leadership said, hey, we can have multiple ideas. Um, basically, what they asked me to do is not to be too stiff-necked on it and think this is the only true way. Mm. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, I changed my position. Uh, I think we all should be not so stiff-necked on our theology. Unfortunately, I think many people are much more stiff-necked than our mainline, but anyways. And the question was raised if this would be kind of like my mission to teach it and to you know promote the non-Trinitarian view within Wyvern. I was like, no, this is not what I want to do. I want to do discipleship. I want to lead people to follow Jesus as their Lord, but the topic of the Trinity is not something that I'm running around and talk about all the time because it's a theological topic and we are a movement that is more about practicals, like what we do, how do we serve people, how do we reach out, how do we do missions? Mm. And so it, all these aspects, they helped to flatten the, the waves and get an understanding in that it should not really be a big problem. I Yeah, that's a success story. And it seems like because the focus of your organization is not a theological focus as much mm -hmm. as a practical focus, they, they've accepted you as a teacher there. That's really quite amazing. And yeah. since that time, how long has it been that you've been involved now? It's been uh, one year now. Okay. And I've been invited to teach in multiple schools, in uh, discipleship schools and in Bible schools. And usually I bring up the topic a little bit. Not in a strong way. Mm -hmm. One school I let wrestle a lot with their view on the uh, Trinity. And I brought up, you know, the different aspects that Dale Tuggy shared once in his podcast about the uh, three self, <laughs> one self, four self Trinity even. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's also fun to see, you know, how people respond to that because for, for many it was like, Oh my goodness, I've never, I never thought about that. <laughs> I didn't even share about Unitarian faith. I just, you know, showed them some issues that there are with the Trinity. Yeah. Um, there's some things like on the Bible school that I taught in last week, I just, you know, it was about Paul. I was teaching about Paul and I brought in a lot of 
challenging topics, so I skipped out on the Trinity for the most part. But I mentioned this meeting when Paul went to Athens. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, you know, just imagine you go there to Athens and you would share the gospel. Like, what would you say? And two of the students, they shared that um, they would talk about, you know, God becoming flesh in Jesus and the incarnation. And for sure, I mean, the Greeks would understand that. But that's not what Paul does. He talks about God sending a man. I said this is one of the big points that leads some people to say that Paul did not believe in a trinity. And they were like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, so it, <laughs> oh, I, I, I like to open the box a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But depending on, on the setting, sometimes I open it more, sometimes less. But uh, most of the things come in personal talks also when people come to me and they ask questions. Like one guy once came to me and shared a question. And I said, like, do you want to hear the Christian answer or do you want to hear my answer? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And he was like, yeah, I want to hear your answer. Oh. And so I, I shared the whole thing and he was like, that totally makes sense. Wow. Yeah. Things like that happen. That's amazing. You know, I love the way Dale Tuggy has in his podcast, like, do you love God enough to think about him? Mm -hmm. There are certain Christian cultural norms which create a pocket of things you don't ask questions about. Yeah. And you're not really teaching them all of these things. You're basically telling them you don't need to have pockets of verboten. Hey, that's German, right? <laughs> yeah, that's German word, <laughs> verboten. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to have these pockets in your faith where you just don't go there, don't ask the questions. That's right. You can open those up trusting that, that the person on the other side of your teaching learns, oh, fascinating. I'm going to spend some more time in Scripture and think about it. Yeah. You know, you're— you're giving them the freedom to explore these things. I really love that. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the people that I'm teaching, even if they remain Trinitarians, if they open up their mind and realize, well, from the Bible, you can have a different perspective. Yeah. And then eventually, if they come across a person who is a biblical Unitarian, hopefully they will be like, well, I've seen this perspective in the Bible. I don't agree with it, but I've seen it. It's okay. I'll let you be. Yeah. And as soon as you agree that Jesus is Lord, we can work together. And if, <laughs> yeah, that, if that is achieved, that's the first big step. That is a big step, yeah. So what are your future plans? What do you expect to happen over the next, I don't know, five years? I would love to have more opportunities to speak uh, and teach in schools. Yeah. I'm not so good in preaching, but if somebody wants a teaching, then I can deliver that. <laughs> so that's really something I would love to go in more because I love the Bible. I love to kindle passion in people for the Bible. Mm -hmm. But we also, that's a very practical thing here on this place. We would love to see more of a dynamic and youth come here in this place because it's just not so much there anymore. Something that we are aiming for as a family. Yeah. Your story gives me hope that there are still possibilities for people to be involved in organizations, even if technically they're isolated. I'd say keep your ear to the ground. There might be other places and other groups that folks could participate in and be, you know, a little catalyst for the future growth of the people that they interact with. Yes. I really hope to see and hear also stories of other people who experience the same maybe and to see this hope that there are places like that. And for me, this is such a big pleasure also to be surrounded by people who think differently. Um, because on the one side, it always gives me the opportunity to reflect on my own beliefs. Mm. Uh, you know, where do I go off? Um, because I, I have to wrestle with thoughts. But on the other side, it also gives me a lot of opportunity where I can help others to reconsider their own ideas. Yeah. Sometimes uh, it would be so nice to just, you know, be surrounded of people <laughs> who also believe in biblical Unitarian faith. That's something you hardly find here in Germany. Yeah. Um, I hope there would be more people on the UCA list, but it's not so many in Germany. You heard me mention maybe recently the idea that we could have a conference in Europe. I would love that. Yes. There's quite a few dots on the UCA map in the England area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're spread around Europe. I think there would be enough people to have a real conference there. And I think it'd be fantastic. That would be a great thing. And I think people would come in. I would love it. I would really love to have a conference in Europe. Yes. Well, maybe we can work that out. Let's give COVID a little more time because that just complicates everything. That's true. <laughs> I think if we did have a European UCA meeting, it would probably be organized and run by folks over there in Europe. So you can keep that in the back of your mind. Who over there would be willing to do it? You know, we would probably have some people from the States able to visit, but in terms of organizing it, location and all that, that's right. it would require somebody who knows Europe to put that together. But yeah. 
But I would love to have an excuse to come to Europe. I have not been to Europe yet. Ah, that would be a good excuse. You could come to Germany and I could show you around some places maybe. And then you could tell your mother-in-law about that. Oh, my mother-in-law would <laughs> love it. She'd be like, can I just come with you? Can I? Yeah. Well, Philippus, thank you so much for taking the time to connect with me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much for having me. If you have feedback, questions, or perhaps bottled up rage that needs a release, I'd enjoy hearing from you. Email podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. Or even more fun, send me some audio that I can include here. You can only take so much of my voice. I like to hear myself, and even I break under the prolonged exposure. So be a blessing to me and to everyone else who has heard a lot from me, and say your thoughts audibly. There's a button in the show notes or on the podcast page, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. Or if you want, just use your phone's recorder and share the file with me via email. One thing you could be sure of, the listeners to the podcast are encouraged when they hear voices from around the world. Thank you to all who have shared in the past. Here's a reminder that there is an email subscription list for this podcast. I send an email along with each episode where I share a few extra thoughts. Those of you on the email list are like my confidants. And if an episode triggers a thought, you can just reply to the email and I'll get it. That's what Carrie in Australia did. She replied to the email that came along with my interview of Bill Schlegel from last week. Carrie noted, I want you to know that your podcasts and Bill's are greatly valued by my husband and myself. Thanks heaps. We just love listening to people's testimonies and their journeys with God. God bless you, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Looking forward to getting to know you better. Last Friday was the release of the second UCA conference presentation. I talked about it last week. A reminder that I'm glad to gather up some questions on Bill's presentation that you think the broader UCA audience may benefit from. Send them along and we'll try to get a Q&A right here in one of the episodes. If you know some Unitarian Christians who live in Europe, perhaps Germany, and maybe they don't realize that there are others, possibly not far away, recommend this episode then maybe they'll discover the UCA directory at unitarianchristianalliance.org and the amazing map. Also, there's a 65% chance that they will thank you. And that's way better than the percentage Jesus got when he healed those lepers. Oh, since you listened all the way to the end, you're one of the dedicated people who would want to know that I'm taking two to three weeks off. I will be prepping for the next year and spending time on the Thomas Emlyn audiobook and visiting family. See you in 2022. Philippus, it was great to hear your voice and the subtle sounds of your kids echoing through your 200-year-old post office. Probably required headphones to hear that. Thank you, and I look forward to visiting in person. Someday. Somehow. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. <laughs>